All creatures at birth are supplied with everything they need for successful survival. All creatures except one are supplied with a set of instincts that will do the job for them, and because of that, they don't need much of a brain. Take the magnificent bald eagle, for example. My wife and I saw dozens of them on a recent fishing trip in Alaska. To see one of them come swooping down and pluck a live and sizable fish from the water on a single pass is astonishing. More astonishing still is the eagle's eyesight. And because of its need to see small rodents moving in the grass from high altitudes or a fish just inches under the surface of the water, its incredible eyes take up just about all of the space in its head. For the eagle, its eyes are the most important thing, and everything else works in unison with them. Its brain is tiny and rudimentary. It doesn't think or plan or remember. It simply acts in accordance with stimuli. And it's the same with most other living creatures. Even the beautiful porpoise with a much larger brain and the chimpanzee are easily tamed and taught. Only one takes twenty years to mature and has dominion over all the rest and the earth itself and has today the power to destroy all life on earth in a couple of hours. Only one is given the godlike power to fashion its own life according to the images it holds in its remarkable mind. Everything fashioned by human beings is a result of goal setting. We reach our goals. That's how we know that the diseases that plague us will be conquered. We've set goals to eradicate every disease that plagues us, and eradicate them we will one by one. We have never set a goal that we have not reached, even landing on the moon, or are now in the process of reaching. No one ever made a purposeful accomplishment without a clear goal toward which to work. I hope you've established yours and that you've begun to think about it frequently every day to impress it into your mind, particularly your remarkable subconscious where forces greater than we can imagine can come to your aid. For a moment, consider the things your mind has brought you. Everything you have, your work, your relationship with your family and others, your philosophy of life all come to you as a result of using your mind, your religion. Now consider the estimate made by experts. You have probably been operating on less than 10% of your mental capacity, and probably much less than that. In an article for the Saturday Review, our old friend Herbert Otto, psychologist, educator, and chairman of the National Center for the Exploration of Human Potential, reminded us that many well-known scientists, such as the late Abraham Maslow, Margaret Mead, Gardner Murphy, O. Spurgeon English, and Carl Rogers subscribe to the hypothesis that man is using a very small fraction of his capacities. Margaret Mead quotes a 6% figure. Herbert Otto writes, my own estimate is 5% or less. Neurological research has shed new light on man's potential. Work at the UCLA Brain Research Institute points to enormous abilities latent in everyone by suggesting an incredible hypothesis. They said the ultimate creative capacity of the human brain may be, for all practical purposes, infinite. To use the computer analogy, man is a vast storehouse of data, but we have not learned how to program ourselves to utilize these data for problem-solving purposes. The following appeared in Soviet Life Today, a USSR English language magazine. It said the latest findings in anthropology, psychology, logic, and physiology show that the potential of the human mind is very great indeed. As soon as modern science gave us some understanding of the structure and work of the human brain, we were struck with its enormous reserve capacity, writes Yefremov, eminent Soviet scholar and writer. He continues, Man, under average conditions of work and life, uses only a small part of his thinking equipment. If we were able to force our brain to work at only half its capacity, we could, without any difficulty whatever, learn 40 languages, memorize the large Soviet encyclopedia from cover to cover, and complete the required courses of dozens of colleges. End of quote. That statement is hardly an exaggeration. It's the generally accepted theoretical view of man's mental potentials. Now, how can we tap this gigantic potential? It's a big and very complex problem with many ramifications. 
But as Herbert Otto points out, it's clear that persons who live close to their capacity, who continue to activate their potential, have a pronounced sense of well-being and considerable energy. They see themselves as leading purposeful and creative lives. The way most people use their minds can be compared to the time back in the early 19th century when just the eastern coast of the North American continent was settled, just a strip along the east coast. To the west stretched the raw, undeveloped great bulk of what was later to become the incredibly rich 90% of the economy. 90% which resulted in the standard of living enjoyed today by Americans. If everything you have is the result of using just 5% of your mind, consider for a moment what it will mean to you and your family if you can increase this percentage. This cassette will show you how to use infinitely more of your mental powers, how to develop some of that more than 90% virgin territory. None of us, as a rule, has the slightest notion of the real capabilities of his or her mind, but believe me when I say that your mind can be compared to an undiscovered gold mine, and it makes no difference whether you're 17 or 70. Look at it this way. Your goal is in the future. Your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you now are and the goal you intend to reach. This is the problem to solve. Robert Seashore, then chairman of the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University, pointed out that successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. And there you have it. Living successfully, getting the things we want from life, is a matter of solving the problems which stand between where we now are and the point we wish to reach. No one is without problems. They're part of living. But let me show you how much time we waste in worrying about the wrong problems. Here's a reliable estimate of the things people worry about. Things that never happen, 40%. Things over and past that can never be changed by all the worry in the world, 30%. Needless worries about our health, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. Real, legitimate worries, 8%. In short, 92% of the average person's worries take up valuable time, cause painful stress, even mental anguish, and are absolutely unnecessary. And of the real, legitimate worries, there are two kinds. There are the problems we can solve. And there are the problems beyond our ability to personally solve. But most of our real problems usually fall into the first group, the ones we can solve if we learn how. There must be millions of people today who feel they're being barred from the life they want because they look upon problems not as challenges to be met, but as wide chasms beyond their ability to bridge. A little research proves that successful people have the same kinds of problems, one of the very real benefits of working with a psychologist or psychiatrist comes from learning that there are hundreds of thousands, even millions of other people, with problems identical to our own. So the whole thing boils down to a matter not of problems which are common to us all, but to our ability to solve them. Now I'm going to assume you've decided on a goal. Remember, you will become, and you will achieve what you think about. That is, if you stay with it, you'll reach your goal. But how? It's right here that your mind comes into play. What is your mind, really? Nobody knows for sure. Perhaps the best way to describe it is to quote Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. In his play, The Secret of Freedom, a character says, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. That's uncomfortably true. The human mind is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the creatures on earth. Everything that means anything to us comes to us through our minds, our love of our families, our beliefs, all of our talents, knowledge, abilities. Everything is reflected through our minds. Anything that comes to us in the future will almost certainly come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet it's the last place on earth the average person will turn to for help. Do you know why? You know why people don't automatically turn their own vast mental resources on when faced with a problem? It's because they never learned to think. Now that is a fact, believe it or not. 
Most people never think at all during the entire course of their lives. They remember, but that's not thinking creatively or in new directions. They react to stimuli, but again, that's not thinking. Remembering to set the alarm at night and getting up when it rings in the morning does not take thought. Nor does showering, shaving, getting dressed, eating breakfast, going to work. At work, we once again fall into comfortable routines. At quitting time, we go home and start repeating the process. Most people, let me say it again, do not know how to think. When they're faced with a problem, they will go to any length to avoid thinking. They will ask advice from the most illogical people, usually people who don't know any more than they do, next-door neighbors, members of their families. Very few of them have reference books. But much more important than that, only one in I don't know how many thousands will take a large notepad, write the problem at the top of the page, and then deliberately turn on his or her thinking apparatus. But some people do think. They do indeed. In order to reflect a moment on the human mind, consider what it's accomplished. As you do, realize that we are developing so rapidly that we've come further in the realm of progress in the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. Of all the scientists who ever lived, it's estimated that 90% of them are alive today. We've reached in the area of ideas and human advancement a plateau so high it was undreamed of by even the most optimistic forecasters as recently as 30 years ago. But every new idea triggers additional ideas, so that now we're in an era of compounding advancement on every front and in every area that stagger the imagination. The harnessing of the power of the sun in our atomic plants and ships the speed of light computers, which in minutes save months and years of calculating drudgery. Every man-made thing you see and touch spawned from the most powerful agency in the world, the human mind. Dr. Harlow Shapley of Harvard has said that we're now entering an entirely new age of man. He calls it the psychozoic age, the age of the mind. And you, my friend, own one, free and clear. Now let's look at a few facts. The 40-hour week long standard is an imminent likelihood of being even further shortened. This means that the average working person has at his disposal an enormous amount of free time. In fact, if you were totally hours in a year and subtract the sleeping hours, if he or she sleeps eight hours every night, you'll find that this person has about 6,000 waking hours, of which less than 2,000 are spent on the job. Now, this leaves 4,000 hours a year when a person is either working or sleeping. These can be called discretionary hours with which that person can do pretty much as he or she pleases. So that you can see the amazing results in your own life, I want to recommend that you take just one hour a day, five days a week, and devote this hour to exercising your mind. You don't even have to do it on weekends. Pick one hour a day on which you can fairly regularly count. The best time for me is an hour before the others are up in the morning. The mind's clear, the house is quiet, and if you like, with a fresh cup of coffee, this is the time to start the mind going. And here's one good way to do it. During this hour every day, take a completely blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write your present primary goal, clearly, simply. Then, since our future depends upon the way in which we handle our work, write down as many ideas as you can for improving that which you now do. Try to think of 20 possible ways in which the activity that fills your day can be improved. You won't always get 20, but even one idea is good. Now remember two important points with regard to this. One, this is not particularly easy. And two, most of your ideas won't be any good. When I say it's not easy, I mean it's like starting any other habit. At first, you'll find your mind a little reluctant to be hauled up out of that old familiar bed but as you think about your work and ways in which it might be improved, write down every idea that pops into your head, no matter how absurd it might seem. Let me tell you what will happen. Some of your ideas will be good and worth testing. The most important thing, however, that this extra hour accomplishes is that it deeply embeds your goal into your subconscious mind, starts the whole vital machinery working the first thing every morning, and 20 ideas a day, if you can come up with that many, total 100 a week, even skipping weekends. An hour a day, five days a week, totals 260 hours a year and still leaves you 3,740 hours of free leisure time. 
Now, this means you'll be thinking about your goal and ways of improving your performance, increasing your service. Six and a half full extra working weeks a year. Six and a half 40-hour weeks devoted to thinking and planning. Can you see how easy it is to rise above that so-called competition? And it'll still leave you with seven hours a day to spend as you please. Starting each day thinking, you'll find that your mind will continue to work all day long. And you'll find that at odd moments when you least expect it, really great ideas will begin to bubble up from your subconscious. When they do, write them down as soon as you can. Just one great idea can completely revolutionize your work and as a result, your life. If you want to develop the muscles of your body, you take daily exercise of some sort. The mind is developed in the same way, except that the returns are out of all conceivable proportion to the time and energy spent. The mind of man can lift anything. His muscles, even the best developed, are puny alongside those of some of the dumbest animals on earth. If man had depended on his muscles for survival, he probably would have disappeared as did the dinosaurs, which were incidentally the most physically powerful and most successful creatures that ever lived. Let me give you just some of the results people have reported to me as a consequence of following this one hour a day routine. An office equipment salesman sold more of his company's product in one month than he informally sold in an entire year during the four years he'd been with his company. A Sunday school teacher with five pupils set a goal of 30 pupils. Her last letter told me she now has a class of 25. She's almost reached her goal. I've used this system for years and it's given me some of the most gratifying and rewarding experiences of my life. And it costs only five hours a week, five hours out of 168. Is it worth it? It's like spending five hours a week digging in a solid vein of pure gold because your mind is all of that and much more. Each time you write your goal at the top of the sheet of paper, don't worry or become concerned about it. Think of it as only waiting to be reached, a problem only waiting to be solved. Face it with faith and bend all the great powers of your mind towards solving it. And believe me, solve it you will. You know, this puts each of us in the driver's seat. Now let's briefly recap. One. This week, start spending one hour a day getting as many ideas as you can. Try for 20 a day on ways to improve what you're now doing. Don't become discouraged. Remember the achievement of your goal very likely depends upon it, as does your whole future. Once you start exercising your mind in this way, I know you'll want to continue the practice. Two, if everything you now have is the result of using, say, five to 10% of your mental ability, you can imagine what life will be like if you can increase this figure to 20% or more. Three, successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. Four, don't waste time and energy worrying about needless things. 40% of them will never happen. 30% have already happened and can't be changed. 12% are needless worries about our health. 10% are petty miscellaneous worries and only 8% are genuine. Try to separate the real from the unnecessary and solve those which are within your ability to solve. Five, the human race has advanced farther during the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. We're now living right in the middle of the golden age man has been dreaming of and praying for for centuries, and it's going to get better. Last of all, the only thing in the world that can take you to your goals in life is your mind, its effective use, and following through on the good ideas it supplies you. Each of us has a tendency to underestimate his or her own abilities. We should realize that we have deep within ourselves, deep reservoirs of great ability, even genius that can be tapped if we'll just dig deep enough. It's the miracle of your mind.